if you could start the recording. So good morning, everybody. Welcome to our guest conference. And we really have an amazing speaker today who Dr. Ho knows very well. So we can let Edwin uh, introduce today's speaker and today's topic. Great, thanks, Azim. So it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our guest this morning, Professor Francesco Maizano, who's joining us from San Rafael Hospital in Milano, Italy, where he's the director of the Heart Valve Center. Um, so Francesco is going to spend the next hour with us discussing tricuspid valve disease and the future of intervention. He's been an important friend and mentor for me personally ever since I had the pleasure of learning from him as a fellow at the University of Zurich. And I can say, it's safe for me to say actually that in addition to being a leader and an innovator in the field, he also has a real passion for teaching. So with that said, welcome Francesco. We're really looking forward to the next hour with you. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you, uh, Azim, for inviting me uh, to this uh, event, this uh, talk. And uh, I will uh, make a typical lecture. You give me always lectures about the future. And uh, it's always a little bit challenging uh, to predict the future, but let's see what we can do today. So we're talking about tricuspid regurge. These are my disclosures. I'd like to clarify that first disclosure, I am a cardiac surgeon by training. So uh, I will probably have a little bit of a bias when we think about the option of uh, surgery versus endovascular procedures in the future. Also, I need to uh, disclose that a lot of the information I will uh, share with you today comes from a, a great uh, uh, great uh, opportunity that we had last year. Uh, we funded a focus group on tricuspid with uh, more than 70 experts from all around the world. And Edwin and Azim are uh, two very important uh, participants to this, uh, uh, to this uh, project. Uh, and we are really trying to uh, focus on uh, tricuspid disease to understand uh, what the future brings and to help this uh, field to grow as fast as possible, but also as good as possible. So on the other hand, when we talk about tricuspid, we talk about something that is uh, not completely understood, still a matter of uh, research and, and uh, a lot of innovation as well. So we only know half of the reality. And uh, thank you, Azim. You wanted me to go in the future, five years from now. So I put some Star Wars uh, starships. And uh, I will also make some uh, uh, nice pictures of uh, reading the, uh, the, the ball of the future and uh, thinking about uh, cardiac surgeons, what they will think in five years from now is the question here, is cardiac surgery going to be the leading solution for patients with tricuspid regurgitation or not? Well, the answer is difficult. And uh, I think uh, in this lecture, there will be a lot of unexpected findings, a lot of unexpected uh, uh, issues. Uh, and I'd like to uh, provoke uh, all the uh, audience here uh, with uh, new concepts which are ongoing. And uh, I really think uh, that this picture that I took last, uh, last week uh, makes the whole thing. Uh, is it a sunrise or is it a sunset? We don't know. We are uh, for sure we are in a turning point. So first of all, this is a something we all, all know that uh, tricuspid regurgitation is undertreated uh, for many reasons, uh, mainly because we believe that tricuspid is not such a bad thing. Uh, the first, uh, uh, the first to uh, uh, let's say downgrade the uh, importance of uh, tricuspid insufficiency has been Nina Brumwald. Uh, but, you know, this concept that tricuspid is secondary to something else and it is not uh, associated with a uh, prognostic impact has been uh, for many years uh, uh, a credo for everybody. And today we are changing a little bit. 
it is clear that patients having tricuspid regurg are patients in a more advanced status after any kind of uh, uh, primary cause. So we have seen uh, tricuspid to be associated with uh, dismal prognosis in heart failure, in, uh, in patients with uh, aortic stenosis, mitral regurg, and so on. But all this uh, evidence was based on uh, on uh, was based on on, on secondary uh, uh, causes, and there was always a question whether uh, tricuspid regurg is uh, the reason for the dismal prognosis or is just a innocent bystander or let's say just a signal of a more uh, advanced disease. In the last few years, there have been growing interest in uh, isolated TR. And today we understand that even in, uh, in absence of a primary cause uh, or a different cause of TR, isolated TR is associated with bad prognosis. And that makes a lot of sense, obviously. You know, tricuspid uh, valve is a valve. And if you have a 50% regurgitant volume, uh, this is going to impact your cardiac output in the long term. Is going to create a lot of problems. So, but all this is coming mainly from uh, a, a serendipity kind of story. Uh, a lot of companies have been working on mitral. Some of these companies were not working in the mitral space. And so they switched to tricuspid. Also, we were treating patients with endovascular procedures who were having uh, a combined tricuspid disease. And we tried to use the mitral uh, devices in, this, in the tricuspid position. So by chance, we started treating tricuspid and we started to understand that there is a, a lot of potential there. All these new options, these new ideas, actually introduced uh, new challenges, but also have been opening the door to new knowledge. So for this reason, I'd like to start to share with you some of the uh, key learning, uh, learnings that we uh, accumulated in the last uh, five years. And I'll start to uh, suggest you some readings. Uh, this is a great uh, uh, publication from Becky Ann. Uh, which is summarizing the um, latest uh, knowledge about tricuspid, understanding pathophysiology and outcome, uh, basically uh, learning from the experience accumulated with uh, the new uh, uh, transcader therapies. First of all, we understand that there is a need for a new classification. There are multiple phenotypes of tricuspid regurgitation. We understand that the current nomenclature has to be revised, particularly when we think about endovascular procedures. We have been uh, rediscussing the quantification methods. And overall, we're learning a lot about the importance of imaging in, uh, in this field. And imaging told us a lot of unexpected things. First of all, that uh, probably the tricuspid valve is the most uh, uh, complex and variable structure in the, uh, in the heart. Uh, there is a huge amount of variability and uh, uh, recent advances in imaging uh, have been instrumental to understand this valve much better than before. The first astonishing uh, message is that 50% of patients, or let's say 50% of individuals have more than three leaflets. So tricuspid is not tricuspid, it's quadricuspid in most of the patients. And uh, there are multiple subcategories of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, tricuspid uh, leaflet uh, distribution. Some of them are uh, uh, important because probably they are associated with uh, a higher degree, a higher risk of developing isolated TR, and some of them are obviously associated with uh, uh, a, a worse prognosis with uh, uh, the current technologies that we have available to treat uh, tricuspid regurgitation. 
again, without uh, triclip, we would never realize the uh, fact that there are many patients with, uh, uh, with more than three leaflets. We also understood that there are a number of patients who have uh, uh, atriogenic uh, secondary TR. We've been always thinking about uh, secondary TR being uh, secondary to pulmonary hypertension. Uh, in the recent uh, uh, years, we realized there are many, many patients who were previously uh, underestimated with uh, a different uh, uh, etiology. And actually, if we go a little bit deeper into the classification, I would uh, suggest again from uh, the same publication from Becky and uh, this publication, this uh, classification, actually, this is really something that came out of the PCR focus group. Uh, a new classification, let's say, a new way to, to look at the class classification of the phenotypes of TR into heterogenic, ventricogenic, but also related to uh, pacemaker leads and organic, uh, which is also a, another uh, important uh, subgroup of patients. What is very interesting about this topic is that actually, if you look at the anatomical and functional characteristics of these patients, there are many differences, many differences in the uh, shape and volume of the right ventricle, the shape of the annulus, and the shape and volume of the right atrium and so on. So it could be that probably that, that each of the each one of these phenotypes have a different uh, natural history and a different prognosis. So we still have to learn about that. In the, I took this picture from uh, one of the publications from you, Azin, uh, and uh, another important learning is that uh, as the uh, disease progresses, the phenotype and presentation of the right heart changes. And probably as this happens, also the uh, treatment opportunities have to be adapted. Now, in the very uh, end stage uh, uh, situations, uh, one of the issues that we still trying to learn is uh, the contractile reserve, or let's say the re resistance to after of mismatch uh, in the right uh, ventricle. We have this, uh, uh, we try to apply uh, mitral concepts in the tricuspid, still uh, not so easy to, to make the parallel. Uh, recently, again, uh, uh, work from, uh, from, uh, from Columbia, uh, but uh, using the, the data from the Trivav registry showed uh, one way to try to understand the contractile reserve and the risk of afterload mismatch in patients undergoing tricuspid interventions using a re relatively simple method of uh, uh, the ratio between the RV function and the, uh, and the pulmonary artery pressure. So all this means we are learning and we are adding knowledge to our patient population. Now, based on all this new knowledge, let's go back to the reality. So what we have seen till now is a lot of data which has been accumulated in a so-called close club. We are a close club of, of, of experts, of uh, let's say people who are fun of this uh, pathology of the right side of the heart. Now, what happens in the guidelines? The guidelines obviously uh, are much more uh, uh, conservative, but still the latest ESC guidelines, uh, which have been uh, recently updated, introduce the concept of uh, transcatheter therapy within the decision-making algorithms for patients with tricuspid regurgitation. Although the recommendation class is uh, conservative, is 2B, and very importantly, if we read uh, carefully, the uh, treatment uh, with uh, a transcatheter option may be considered in inoperable patients in heart valve centers with expertise, which means 
according to the current guidelines, surgery remains first line options for all patients, all comers. Well, I'm not surprised about this uh, reading of the data. And I think I also agree because we are still uh, in the early stage. But uh, is this uh, assumption going to be stable in the next five years? This is the question uh, that you asked me, uh, Azim. And uh, I'd like to stop a second uh, because these are ESC guidelines. So I'd like to involve you in this discussion one second and say, what do you think about guidelines? Are you unhappy about these guidelines? Would you expect uh, the guidelines to be a bit more uh, sportive? Erwin? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, with the current state and the knowledge, it, it's probably pretty reasonable in terms of where they sort of landed at, just as a balance in terms of consideration, uh, but ensuring the adequate amount of expertise and multidisciplinary evaluation. Um, so I think it seems reasonable. Yeah, I, I would argue, just to be controversial, uh, maybe different. I don't see why you wouldn't give transcatheter treatment a 2A guideline, a 2A, because if you look at it, I don't see any randomized data for surgery versus medical therapy or, or any randomized data really for surgery in the tricuspid field, other than the latest CTS net study, which is kind of a different group of patients. It's not isolated TR. So I would argue, you know, there's a lot of data from registry data, multi-center registry data, um, showing the safety of this of technologies like transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge and triclip, um, and that it does decrease TR. Why wouldn't you put it to a guideline right now until you have randomized data? Yeah, and actually, i just like to uh, give you a vignette of this discussion. Uh, just yesterday morning, uh, we had the heart team discussion. Uh, Alfieri brought uh, a patient uh, 75 years of age with isolated TR, uh, initial uh, enlargement of the right chambers. Uh, and uh, this patient has been referred to him for uh, endovascular procedure. And so there was a question from the audience, and why not surgery? And uh, actually, the question is, why not endovascular? So who knows what is the best solution for these patients? To be honest, according to guidelines, again, surgery remains a first-line option. So whenever we go for endovascular, we need to declare or to define this patient high risk for surgery. I will go into this, into this uh, uh, issue uh, in detail in a few moments, but uh, uh, let's, let's really go back to this uh, comprehensive picture. Uh, are these new hopes remaining hopes or uh, is something going on there? So uh, I think, uh, there are many, many things that we need to realize. First of all, I'd like to highlight this uh, publication from uh, Giulio Russo. Uh, again, it's, uh, it's a European journal, Heart Failure. Uh, it's, it's another editorial uh, collecting a number of uh, good ideas. So it's another good reading for those who want to start thinking about tricuspid. But the message here is very interesting is uh, can we adapt, adopt old strategies or should we adapt to the new opportunities? So is it, is it correct today to keep the same mindset, the same uh, mentality uh, uh, when we see patients today, given the fact that we have different uh, options, particularly in those centers who have uh, experience with uh, new technologies? And the other point, uh, which is very well taken in this publication, is not the first time we talk about this topic, but here there is a very omnicomprehensive picture showing that a lot of the concepts that we are using on the tricuspid uh, disease have been derived one-to-one -one from mitral, and probably this is a wrong assumption. So the more I do, the more I... Uh, the more I am involved in tricuspid interventions, the more I have a doubt that what I have as a standard practice in my background can be applied to the new technologies. 
let me go one step behind and uh, i think this is a common experience for those who have been uh, starting uh, in uh, treating tricuspid the first initial step has been uh, to apply uh, uh, the mitra clip in the in the tricuspid space uh, just in, a, in the i was calling this a drive through option i mean we were treating mitrals and we were just pulling back the device and trying to clip the tricuspid and that time was really a bit crazy. We had a lot of doubts, uh, you know, we didn't, somebody was using an internal jugular approach uh, because uh, we were thinking it was too difficult to go from the femoral. We are using a lot of this uh, multimodality imaging. I remember we were lost, so we were using echo navigation for, uh, for these procedures. So it was really something uh, experimental, uh, very pioneeristic. But Today, this is not anymore a pioneer, it's not anymore a, a novelty. Today, we have a dedicated devices uh, and we have data and we are uh, collecting this data. And I can tell you in each uh, center, the, 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 the results are improving. Uh, the two years outcome of the trilumia trial being uh, uh, presented last year at, at, at Euro PCR, showing that uh, overall you have uh, some reduction of TR, which remains stable at two years. As you see here, 60% of patients have uh, less uh, than uh, uh, severe TR. Obviously, there is a number of patients who have still some uh, residual TR, and this is a matter of discussion and also opens the discussion to alternative to, uh, to triclip. But for sure, what we see, and this is very important, we see these patients getting less symptomatic, better quality of life, better functional capacity, even with a small reduction of tricuspid regurg. Very importantly, these patients who are uh, initially, you know, most of these patients are, uh, are uh, uh, very end stage with a lot of uh, uh, comorbidities. Uh, you can see that treating tricuspid is reducing the need for hospitalization. So there is a clinical value associated with this technology, with these uh, therapies. And don't forget the, 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 this, this registry has been uh, uh, performed with the, with the previous generation. Now we have a second generation, sorry, fourth generation uh, system where the results are much better. We can abolish TR in many patients. We don't have only uh, triclip, we also have Pascal. Uh, and so different devices and many others are coming for lifted repair. And overall, we see that these patients have an advantage. Again, not all these patients are responders. Not all these patients have been treated correctly. We, there is also learning curve. And there is a discussion whether lifted repair is the best solution particularly because we, we saw in the Triva registry already a few years ago that those patients who are not responding to, uh, to uh, tricuspid uh, repair, uh, they have a much worse prognosis than those who are respondents. So for this reason, we need to think about it a little bit more broad than just uh, uh, lifted repair. There are alternatives, uh, annuoplasty, and replacement are the main ones. You know, there are also out of the box ideas. But I think uh, in these regards, there are many, many solutions there, out there. There are many different technologies. There is a little bit also of confusion around. And so again, I'd like to now suggest you the third reading of the day. And this is probably the most important one. The PCR focus group have been uh, producing after one year of discussions, this state-of-the-art uh, uh, publication. And we did the state-of-the-art publication. There are a number of uh, important uh, uh, concepts, but probably one very interesting is uh, a decision-making algorithm for device selection in patients undergoing transcatheter uh, repair replacement. And I will not go through the specific uh, algorithm because I don't think it's the topic of the day, but you can see here that at the end of the decision-making, there are different options going from transcatheter edge to edge to, re to replacement. Now, 
Annuoplasty, for instance, is uh, something that is done uh, almost in every uh, surgical patient undergoing uh, valve repair. Uh, we developed uh, uh, the, the, this, uh, this technology uh, many years ago, and Azim, you've been also with me involved in many of these uh, procedures and in the R&D of this device. And we understand that, you know, this is a surgical annuoplasty which can be delivered with the cather, uh, has been associated with, uh, with uh, sustainable results, with the reduction of annual dimensions, a reduction of uh, TR severity, improvement of symptoms. In the post-market registry, this data have been uh, somehow reproduced uh, with uh, a number of patients uh, having uh, uh, improved uh, tricuspid regurgitation. Again, not all patients are responders. And again, there are some uh, rules to choose between leaflet repair and uh, annular repair. I will not go too much into this. Obviously, the best uh, indication for uh, uh, annual uh, approach is the patient without uh, tethering and with more uh, coaptation gap, while the patients with less coaptation gap and, uh, gap and, and more tethering and more, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they are probably better responders with uh, lifted repair. But there is one big elephant in the room. And uh, the big elephant in the room is that this procedure is not easy. And that's why annuoplasty at the moment is still performed in few hospitals around the world. We know how much, uh, how, how much uh, uh, cumbersome can be to learn this technique, how important is the imaging. And for, with generation one, I think uh, remains a challenging procedure, but I am 100% sure once the technology improves, this may come back as an important option and keep this in mind when we discuss uh, it, what happens in five years from now. Obviously what happens in five years from now is also potentially we have uh, uh, the uh, option of uh, re re replacing valves. And uh, this is an example of uh, a device I'm involved with. Uh, you, Azim, as well, have been involved in that. I think uh, sooner or later we should come to Montefiore with this device. Uh, the um, the CardioVal is one of the many devices. I think uh, it's not so different from Evoke. Is a device that, which is anchoring on leaflets. Uh, it has. Uh, uh, not so uh, is not relying so much on 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 oversizing, but what I think is important about valve replacement is the reproducibility, is the simplicity of the concept. Uh, the devices are still in the uh, in the first uh, generation uh, uh, iteration. There are some uh, improvements which have, the, have to be uh, added to many of these uh, devices, but in principle, replacement in the tricuspid seems much easier than repair. And uh, uh, the, the concept of uh, what is better between repair and replacement is coming also in tricuspid, but probably since tricuspid is so complicated compared to, to mitral for many reasons, it could be that replacement may play a bigger role in this field. Uh, although, again, I just like to show few pictures from the first cement. This was the very first cement case that we did with cardio. It was a very simple procedure. Uh, you just opened the, the device in the vent, you engage the leaflets, and once you engage the leaflet, you release the valve, and this is the valve release, and immediately the valve works. In valve replacement compared to valve repair, I think what is a key element is patient selection because here you can evoke uh, after all this match. While this is not the case of uh, in in uh, in patients with uh, with uh, uh, undergoing repair. Evoke uh, has been uh, uh, recently involved in uh, in uh, uh, first in main trials and in uh, in larger trials and recently. In a pivotal trial, just like the triclip, uh, we're waiting, waiting for these results. I just seen this morning on, on LinkedIn uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, slide coming from one of your publications, Azim, is a, is a review on, uh, on the, the two uh, studies on Evoke showing excellent results. Uh, low mortality or cold mortality has been 2% uh, at 30 days in cardiac mortality. 
obviously these are very highly selected patients as we know much higher higher selected than uh, uh, than those undergoing repair so this is what is possible with catheters now let's go back and see what is uh, surgery i go back to the uh, to the uh, guidelines uh, because i think it's important to to step back one second and uh, i show you first of all this slide in four years everything changed compared to 2017 uh, the guidelines to 2021 are totally different and guess what there has been increase an upgrade in level of evidence for surgery many of the recommendations have been upgraded and uh, <clears throat> going into class one and many achieved the uh, level of evidence uh, uh, higher than C. This is a, is a big uh, novelty in, in surgery. But to be honest, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the publications uh, uh, are the same of the previous guidelines. So I, you know, this is a bit controversial. There is an upgrade in evidence, but with the same publication as four years before, but it's okay. We'll, uh, we'll, discuss, it. we'll discuss that. Now, if I go into surgery, what is surgery? Compared to endovascular, surgery can uh, achieve more uh, technical perfection probably because we have a direct vision, we have multiple tools, we have a number of different techniques. And you see here, the techniques are the same that we have also percutaneous. So big difference in the concept is not, but obviously in the, in, in the way we can deliver the therapy, Surgery, to some extent, is much easier when we talk about the specific maneuver on the heart. Obviously, is much more invasive for the patient. Annuloplasty is the mainstay of uh, valve repair. And, uh, you know, in surgery, we don't need specific multimodality imaging. Every surgeon should measure the hand. This is my hand, seven centimeters. If the hand goes inside of the, my, uh, the tricuspid valve like this, then you need to do an annuloplasty. This is very important, very simple uh, concept. You don't need any CT scan. You put an annuloplasty with sutures. Uh, uh, we never hit the coronary artery. Very interesting difference, different from, uh, from, uh, from uh, cardioband, where we have trouble uh, anchoring uh, the, the system. Uh, sometimes you get into the right coronary. We need to take care of that. And after that, we implant very small rings. Look at this ring compared to my hand. So actually, this is a 30 millimeter ring, and you see the difference with the, with the, with the, uh, the size of my hand. We can have different shapes of the rings with different uh, models. Every surgeon has his own uh, model. At the end of the day, there have been some publications showing some difference. But if you look at this recent uh, uh, um, uh, meta-analysis, uh, basically, there is no big difference in the recurrence of TR, uh, whether you use a suture-based, a ring, a, ring uh, a, co a complete ring, a rigid ring, a flexible ring, there is basically no difference. What makes the difference is, as usual, is the indication, is the functionality of the right ventricle. In case of tethering, obviously, we know that annual plastic does not work. For these cases, uh, you need to add some leaflet repair, which can be augmentation or the clover, which is the surgical predicate of, uh, of uh, the edge, transcatheter edge to edge. Uh, augmentation <clears throat> is uh, not so commonly done, but uh, can be very useful. The clover technique uh, is also not commonly done. And is, I show you this, uh, images of uh, me trying to do clover in a beating heart in a minimal invasive approach as you see it's not that easy even uh, even uh, uh, the uh, the surgical edge to edge is not uh, uh, so easy you need to define exactly the center of the leaflets uh, be uh, also in this case try to be symmetric uh, and precise and and uh, target the cordal free zone uh, this is a, an example of uh, leaflet augmentation. By the way, this is a leaflet augmentation that uh, was done in a patient with uh, severe tethering, and it was a failure. And I show you why it was a failure. Now you see the anterior leaflet is detached here, 
And you can see there are direct connections of the anterior leaflet to the free wall. And this is why with the minimal increases of uh, ventricular volume, you may have uh, uh, recurrent TR. Now, recurrent TR after surgery is a big problem, much bigger than after a, a, a cardio. And after the cardio, and I can put a clip and I don't care. After surgery, I feel guilty that I did the open surgery. So for, you know, surgery is a big decision. For this reason, the numbers are increasing overall, but not so much. And the big issue is overall, there is an average risk for the isolated tricuspid surgery between five and 10%. The data say always about 9%. Recently, there have been a publication on uh, the value of, of uh, surgery in isolated TR, and basically, it looks like there is no benefit in treating these patients. There is uh, no big difference. There is no improvement in survival if these patients are submitted to surgery. Whether you do repair replacement doesn't change that much. And on the other hand, uh, uh, in the recent guidelines, there have been, uh, as I told you before, an upgrade. This upgrade, one of the one of the uh, uh, one of the papers uh, here, uh, which have been cited to give a B level of evidence, is this uh, uh, publication uh, from uh, from uh, the uh, the group of Mike Mack, and showing that the outcomes have been improving. And probably it's true, it is, they are improving, but basically is improving whenever you have an improvement in patient selection. There are some technical improvements so we can do these procedures mainly on beating heart rather than on a rested heart. We know that if we do repair is better than replacement in most occasions, there is a, 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 there is a, a benefit in the late mortality. And this is a publication from San Raffaele uh, adopting the uh, staging from, uh, from your publication, Azim, uh, stage one to stage five. As, as you see, if you treat patients in stage uh, two or three, mortality is very low and also the uh, morbidity is very low. Obviously, the more complex the clinical uh, presentation, the higher the, higher the, uh, the chance of having a complicated outcome. How do we predict the risk of, uh, of, the, of, the, of surgery? Uh, I, I suggest you to look at this paper from uh, Julien Dreyfus. It's not uh, Dreyfus, it's not uh, uh, the, the, the surgical Dreyfus, it's a, it's a cardiology Dreyfus, who developed in France uh, this uh, three score registry, is a risk score for in hospital mortality which is a simple additive score, uh, including age, NYH class, uh, uh, right side the heart failure, the dose of furosemide, the renal function, the hepatic function, the left, uh, left uh, uh, heart function, and the right heart function. And uh, if the score goes beyond uh, five, the mortality is, is escalating uh, in an exponential way. So this score could be helping us in selecting the, I, the patients for, uh, uh, for a surgery or for alternative options. Obviously, this is not being validated for this, uh, for this application. And, and as usual, uh, it's a score which has been uh, designed and, and developed on operated patients. So it has always a, a big limitation. So as you have seen, I showed you a lot of data a lot of confounding data, a lot of confounding messages. Surgery is high risk, but is also low risk in the low risk patients. This is uh, easy to understand. Uh, the uh, transcated procedures are emerging, but not always very effective. In some cases, we have residual TR. So there is a lot of confusion at the moment. We are still building knowledge. And so let's go five years from now. So let's, let's try to answer your question, Azim. I'd like to, ask, to answer this question by uh, telling you that the question is wrong because I don't see difference between a, 
uh, open surgery and a transcathed procedure, other than we are developing or we are evolving from the classical uh, surgery to uh, surgery 2.0, where you add to the uh, benefit of seeing structures also to work under physiological conditions. This is very important when we talk about atrioventricular valves. Really, the beauty of working under beating heart Paraphysiology conditions is fundamental to achieve good results. And I think uh, as imaging improves, uh, I don't think uh, surgery will ever be able to be better than uh, transcathed procedures. It's all about technology there. So my answer is rather than surgery or interventional procedures, I think timing is everything. And I show you two very short cases, and this is my end, and then we're ready for discussion. I have two patients. One patient is a uh, patient who has uh, no, um, no pacemaker leads, isolated TR, very early indication, let's say, not early, but right indication is the patient has been followed up for 10 years, but uh, she is uh, coming with very little symptoms, only fatigue, uh, normal renal function, normal hepatic function, no, no big swelling of the legs, eovolemic. She has a type 3A anatomy, and this patient has an excellent result with uh, two triclips. The, same, the other patient is a patient with perfect anatomy, so is a type 1, so three leaflets, uh, but she has a, a pacemaker lead. She's end stage with hepatorenal dysfunction. This patient, we reduced the R. I'm not sure we're going to change the prognosis here. So these are the two sides of the spectrum. One side is, uh, the, the last one is the typical patient we see, to, we, see we have seen the, in the last five years, patients with, without alternatives where we try to do something. And the first patient is the patient where we treat early enough with a non-invasive procedure. And what we learned is that uh, as the pathology evolves, uh, the risk of the procedure and the benefit, uh, the risk increases and the benefit decreases. The big problem is that uh, in most of these patients, we, we keep on thinking that these patients can wait. So at the beginning of the story of the clinical history of these patients, they, we tend to say, to, to say it is too early for an intervention, particularly when we think about surgery, which is uh, uh, invasive and has, uh, it comes with consequences. If, if not with mortality, it is a uh, discomfort for the patients, particularly for the elderly population. So we tend to say very often that the patient can wait and often it's too early for intervention until one day this patient switch from too early to too late. And, and to identify the turning point is probably the most difficult thing today. So this has to be probably brought back into a very complex a new heart team, which is uh, focused on, uh, on the right, uh, right side of the heart, which is much more complicated than the left side of the heart. And for those who have been really dedicating a lot of time on, on this topic, I think uh, many of the questions are becoming more clear, but still there is a lot to be learned. What we learned for sure is that the tricuspid disease is more relevant than we previously thought. We underestimated the prognostic impact of uh, severe TR. We know that interventional therapies uh, are becoming an, an important option. And this is not just an alternative uh, to surgery, but also they are creating uh, the opportunity to, uh, to experiment, to understand the, 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 the pathology better. So there has been an increase in awareness in the community, thanks to these less invasive procedures, which are opening new perspectives. So. Today, still, surgery is considered gold standard. 
And this has been seen also in the latest recommendation lines. What the future brings, you know, only God knows, uh, but I am pretty sure that as uh, technology evolves, uh, also in this field, uh, we will see similar to mitral, uh, functional mitral regurg, that transcatheter procedures are becoming first line option, particularly because they allow early intervention, even in the elderly population. But one thing is for sure that uh, we are seeing patients earlier. We see patients where we doubt whether an endovascular approach is better than surgery because many of these patients now coming to our uh, hospitals are operable. And so one result out of this uh, five years of innovation is that uh, for sure tricuspid is not anymore forgotten. And I'd like to, I'd like you to uh, leave you with uh, this uh, song, uh, Unforgettable, Tricuspid is Unforgettable. Thank you, Azim. That's great, Francesco. Thank you. I was, I was about to ask you uh, who the singer was, and then I remembered this from, from MVM, because the picture on the right hand is stood. I mean, the patient who's had a previous stenotomy and, and you know, the JVP is up. You had me with the one on the left. Um, Francesco, we have a lot of people on, including some of our heart failure colleagues who maybe hopefully want to ask some questions. Um, but I'm going to ask, let's start with Edwin first, and then we'll go through some of the questions from the chat and then some of our colleagues who are uh, online. Sure, thanks so much for this great overview of uh, where the field is at, where we may be going. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on uh, a little bit what you mentioned about, you know, the heart team and how that's evolving. So obviously the field is moving rapidly forward. How do you see, I guess, clinicians, valve clinicians, proceduralists, imagers evolving with that? And what do you think uh, in terms of how traditional roles of surgery, interventional cardiology, you know, non-interventional cardiology, how does that fit in? Well, first of all, it's a revolution overall, and uh, we need to think uh, beyond uh, the walls of the hospital. So when I think about the heart team, the heart team is not anymore confined within the hospital. It is a heart team that goes into the network, into the, 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 the network of care, because these patients live in, 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 their, in their daily life outside of the hospital. So I see a growing need for clinical cardiologists engaged in this uh, process where instead of uh, what, what we did in the past, it was a catastrophic uh, solution. You know, you have, uh, uh, you have something very bad. You have a very high risk procedure surgery. The patient dies or survives. It, if it survives, it's done. It's completely corrected. It doesn't need much, any, much anymore. Now we have less invasive procedures. Maybe they're not really uh, finalizing the treatment. They can help, uh, uh, they, can be, uh, sus they can sustain medical therapy uh, to make this medical therapy more successful. Uh, imagine tricuspid is one of these examples. If you treat a patient with triclip and uh, you forget about the medical treatment, the patient will come back. Uh, the patient responds to therapy after reducing TR, but you need to keep following this patient. So I see an important role of those physicians who are outside of the hospital working together with us so that we can uh, deliver a lifetime management to these patients. Um, there, was, there was a question um, from Ulrich Jode. Uh, Uli is uh, the head of heart failure here, Francesco, at um, Monty. And we collaborate very closely with heart failure for all our mitral and tricuspid patients. They actually have been our strongest referrals. Um, Uli, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, can you can. hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so, Francesco, this is an exceptional lecture. I, I so enjoyed it. I learned so much. I have a question. Uh, I think... Um, at the very end, you framed uh, the field for the heart failure cardiologist, and this is when to send the patient. And uh, I want to ask a question about your first patient uh, that you said was early. 
This patient uh, has been observed for 10 years and is now uvolemic and undergoes a highly successful procedure. I see a lot of such patients go into uh, the clinical trials. Uh, and I'm really very concerned about it. Uh, and the reason is that the endpoint for the clinical trials is heart failure, hospitalization, or death. And I'm concerned that in the usual two-year window that we have these trials, this patient uh, may not uh, be uh, admitted again. And the other patient who was randomized, a similar patient randomized to no procedure, may also not get admitted. So I, I wonder um, how should we treat these patients that have uh, structural disease, but no evidence of dysfunction, say they have a CVP less than 10, which I see all the time going into clinical trials. I am worried about this. I very much believe in the therapy, but I'm concerned that these patients may not uh, be late enough to get a clinical benefit in the time that the trials are done. So Francesca, I also want to give some context. You know, Uli is one of the people on the heart failure screening committee for Triluminate. Okay, and he's one of the leading people there. So he's getting to review just about every single patient that's being enrolled in Triluminate. And I think you know this is also a valid concern for all of us. I'd love to. Yeah, we all love to hear your thoughts. So I think is a great point, and and you know honestly. Before I answer the question, let me give you another point which is important for the audience. Uh, we are running much faster than we thought. Uh, these te technologies and devices and, and, and trials have been established much earlier than I ever thought about. So we really observe the unexpected. And we somehow we are learning as we move forward. What I, what I have been learning, and I have to confess my ignorance, I'm, you know, don't forget I'm a surgeon, so I, my level of uh, evidence is very low. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't understand much about the clinics of these patients. And I think uh, the more I see patients, the more I understand why these patients are not referred to us, but probably they're not even referred to heart failure specialists. Mainly, you know, I give you the example of passion number one. You asked me the question, passion number one, a volemic, uh, early, in brackets, early because it's been followed for, for 10 years and now referred because ongoing uh, uh, enlargement of the right chambers. Now, this patient, when she came to me first, I said, how are you? I feel good. This is a typical answer. Many patients say, I feel good in front of the doctor. They don't want to be treated. And first of all, right. she was referred to me for surgery. So they send me the patient to do minimal invasive uh, tricuspid. Still, it's still surgery. Then I start talking to the patient. And the patient say, you know, she has fatigue. So she's not performing anymore like before. These patients, they don't have a overt uh, heart failure uh, they don't have a weird need for a heart failure hospitalization. They don't have uh, uh, a renal dysfunction. Uh, 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 they don't have ascites. These patients, many of these patients, they have chronic low cardiac output. If you go, I think the key element here is to select patients by uh, using more often right heart catheterization than before. These patients, yeah. they have low cardiac output arrest. Many of those patients, they cannot increase cardiac output during exercise. So I believe that this is going to be our main indicator for early referral. Whenever yeah. we see the patient growing in the right side, we need to be careful because one day, and this is unexpected, one day they go from totally asymptomatic to untreatable. And so... Yeah. Uh, that doesn't answer the trial. Okay, the, the trial issue, I agree with you, is a big, a big problem. And so to, to demonstrate that this is a good strategy, we'll need probably much more patients because obviously early treatment requires uh, higher numbers. But the sweet spot 
of treatment is the patient before the, uh, the patient develops hepatorenal dysfunction. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful you, you uh, said that we need to do uh, exercise uh, right out catheterization in these patients to really capture uh, what's going on. So fantastic. Thank you so much. Amazing lecture. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Oli, I, I have to say, I think it's something, we, it's not been part of our workflow yet, Monty. Uh, it but just I has become. It has it become. It has just we, become you know, part of the workflow. Right, absolutely. <laughs> Especially for these tricuspid patients who say they're asymptomatic and we're seeing already some artery dysfunction. We, we struggle with how to convince the patient often that, you know, waiting is a bad thing. And I think the exercise hemodynamics may be a great way of doing that. So you're gonna, you, you'll see us talking a lot more about it. It's a great suggestion from both of you. Thank you. Um, before I pass you on to some of the live questions, um, Francesco, there are a couple of questions here. The one is from Jennifer, one of our cardiology fellows. And she's really asking about, you know, RV dysfunction, RVPA and coupling in the presence of severe AR, uh, severe TR. I mean, is, you know, can we predict RV dysfunction with RVPA uncoupling? And if, if the uncoupling is severe, you know, is it enough for us to say not to do a procedure in that patient? That overlaps with another question as well, where I think everybody's asking the same things is how do we truly assess the RV? Uh, what do you think is the best measure, even for surgery, that you feel comfortable operating on somebody? Uh, and with that is also linked, you know, pulmonary hypertension and how do we take pulmonary hypertension into all of this? So I'm sorry, it's, a, it's kind of three questions almost in one, but they link together. Yeah, see, uh, all this question goes around uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, right heart physiology where we are, uh, to be honest, we are not so uh, smart there. We are all learning. There are many uh, confounders uh, in this uh, understanding. First of all, you know who are the, 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 the ones who know very well right heart physiology are the, uh, cardio the con congenital cardiologists who have been uh, seeing patients with... Uh, with Fontana physiology, with uh, uh, Epstein. And you keep uh, hearing the concept that, you know, the patient can survive for a long time with a TR again. But honestly, I still believe that this is a, diff this is a new, uh, new pathology, or let's say it's not new, obviously, because it's not that we created now, but it's something we start to understand now in, in a different way. We are rejuvenating uh, right calf. Azim, I think you've been going back to school. I, I can imagine that, uh, you know, you can do it. I don't, I'm not sure you can understand it because I can do it. I don't understand it. You know, we have a specialist for, for that in our, in, in our, in our uh, heart center now. That's why I have Oli and his team. <laughs> so, honestly, honestly, it's, it's, it's a gift. To have somebody who really understands uh, uh, right heart cuff and help you uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the evaluation and the interpretation of what we see. So now the answer about uh, the risk, I would say, I think the RA. PA or whatever, RVPA coupling or whatever you want to, you know, whatever measurement you want to use for the risk of a procedure applies mainly to either surgery or business only to, in my opinion, only to replacement. If you, if you perform a, a triclip or a, or, or a cardio band in a patient with a tricuspid regurge, and you, let's say you evoke afterload mismatch. Usually what happens, the right ventricle dilates and the valve uh, goes back to uh, regurgitation. So it doesn't really develop easily uh, uh, a, a, a overt uh, uh, RV dysfunction with uh, low cardiac output. I've never seen that, to be honest, in my practice. Uh, while I have seen it, unfortunately, in uh, valve replacement. Uh, we've seen it uh, after surgery, 
but surgery have confounded us. I mean, I, I don't like too much surgery because these confounders are not so easy to be predicted, but obviously you have the confounder of the stress of the procedure, potentially the ischemia. Even if you go beating heart for some reason, uh, the right ventricle doesn't like to be on, on the hardline machine. There are uh, inflammatory responses and, and, uh, and a neurohumoral response to surgery that makes the right ventricle suffer after even if you do a beating heart without any ischemia. So uh, I'm very convinced that we need to study deeply after mismatch in patients undergoing replacement or patients who have a potential candidacy for, for surgery for, for uh, re transcader repair, probably it's less of an issue. Uh, what is the best way? Don't I, I, you know? You can uh, ne next time you ask uh, Becky Ann, she will make a, a list of uh, indicators, and, and uh, you know there are so many ways to to assess the right ventricular function. I still don't know which one is the best one. I like to be honest uh, to treat patients who have uh, uh, increased uh, cardiac output uh, under uh, uh, exercise test right calf. If the patient has no increase of cardiac output during the exercise, I feel a bit worried. And obviously, fixed hypertension uh, is basically, if not a contraindication, is uh, something that you need to think about. Yeah. In some occasions, I have to be also, uh, I, I have the impression that in some occasions, the uh, pulmonary hypertension is the result of uh, a hyper hypervolemic state that you can somehow control in these patients. Perfect. Thank you, Francesco. Um, we're not going to keep you much longer. Maybe a couple of questions quickly. Uh, Andrea, Scotty, I see you uh, on the video. Bye, Andrea. Professor Maisano, thank you for your great talk as usual. I fully agree with you <clears throat> regarding the surgical um, role for uh, tricuspid tre procedures, especially if we consider that surgical patients, their outcomes come from patients who have baseline characteristics that are far, um, uh, that are far better than the one we can see in uh, transcatheter patients. So my question is regarding transcatheter replacement, uh, in your algorithm in Serafale, how do you, um, which are the patients you are considering for replacement and which is the role in uh, right now in uh, your center? Well, you know, it's, it's a difficult question because first of all, uh, you compare a off the shelf procedure to something which is still experimental. So as you can imagine, uh, we don't have a real algorithm, uh, but you need to consider replacement in those, in those patients who have uh, uh, contraindications for repair, meaning uh, contraindication, the main contraindication for lifted repair is going to be patients with a very excessive uh, uh, coaptation gap or with uh, some organic lesions or presence of a pacemaker lead uh, with some specific characteristics that you think uh, they're not going to be responding to edge-to-edge. To, uh, -edge. And in case of, uh, of, uh, of annuloplasty is uh, mainly the, the presence of tethering. So I, I think there will be a growing role for this, uh, for, uh, for replacement in those patients. And uh, we'll see what happens so at the moment uh, this is not yet available, but soon it will be available in Europe because I think CMARC is, is going to come for, for Evoke and uh, so keep this question for uh, six months from now and I will answer to you. Okay, thank you. Pierre Pasquale and then Augustine and then uh, we may stop. All right, Dr. Maisano, thank you very much uh, for the talk. Just a quick question. You were talking about a 75 year old uh, patient earlier in your talk. And you know you were deciding where to go, you know, what, what, kind, of, what kind of intervention would have been better for this patient. And then you talked about TriScore. Um, do you think eventually something like that, so like a score that can help us out to figure out what kind of procedure is better for a determined patient would work for us? And uh, also, I guess the real question is, uh, we've seen like an almost 20 years of um, TAVR, how right now we're really independently acting on aortic valve or aortic stenosis. 
uh, according to the surgical risk. Do you think, you know, I know we are on the right side of the heart. Uh, I know we are on the atrioventricular um, valve, but do you think eventually in a five years, 10 years from now, and with the procedures getting easier, faster, and better, we have a chance to actually implement uh, transcatheter therapies independently of uh, surgical risk? Yeah, I mean, again, I, my personal point of view, I, I really think surgery and interventions, they are very complementary. And the que- it's very simple, the answer. If you can do it with a cadre, why should you do it open? It doesn't make any sense. So once uh, we demonstrate that uh, uh, you can uh, you can perform a, a, a f- effective and safe procedure with the catheter, then there is no re- need for surgery unless there is an infection or other things. So no discussion about that. Uh, in terms of the scores, you know, I am you know I don't like to be honest uh, scores in general. I think uh, they are good, uh, good ways to publish on, in, in, in nice papers. Uh, as you know, scores are, are uh, influenced by a lot of biases. First of all, the first of all is that uh, any surgical score, Euro score, the price score as well, they're only based on patients who have been operated. It, they don't right. take into account all the patients who have been excluded from surgery. So there is a potential uh, risk of, uh, of uh, uh, using a score which is not applying to the population we have in front of us. And last but not least, being a surgeon who can do open and endovascular procedures, I give you my perspective, which is a big bias, uh, sorry, a big, a big conflict that I have inside of my, my heart every time I'm in front of a patient. I am scared about uh, proposing surgery because I know that there are so many uncertainties around surgery. Surgery is depending, depending on, an, on, a, on a quality chain, which is much longer than an interventional procedure. Okay. Interventional procedure is very short and it either goes or doesn't go. It happens in a few hours. Patient is awake and goes uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the regular world. In many cases, there are many there are much less uh, uncertainties around uh, a interventional procedure. But also very importantly, I mean, you see the patient walking uh, two, one or two days later, walking home, uh, particularly if you treat patients in, uh, not in uh, end stage conditions. So in a 75 years old uh, lady, <clears throat> oh, no, this was a man actually, I didn't see the patient, but I tell you the, the patient number one I showed you before this patient came to me, 80 year old, uh, very good person, very strong, excellent conditions, no comorbidities, perfect, perfect. And she was referred to me for surgery. And I spoke to the lady about three times before she decided to get uh, be uh, to be operated. And uh, after three times we met, I, I thought in my mind, I said, why should I operate uh, open heart? So I started talking about uh, endovascular. And the reason is very simple. If uh, you are 80 year old, even if I do a minimal invasive, ni- nice procedure, uh, small incision below the breast, uh, no rib, sp- rib spreading, don't stop the heart, uh, probably no transfusion still, when you are 80 year old, you have to stay one week, uh, more or less, uh, in, uh, in the hospital, two, three days in the bed, a uh, few, few days in the rehabilitation. It will take three to six months to come back to normal life. And this is unacceptable when you are 80 year old. You want to live your life today. So uh, I don't think the risk factors, I mean, the risk course should be the main driver. We should really be uh, individualizing therapies according to uh, the patients we are talking to and providing we are informing the patients fully about what we're going to do. Thank you so much. Thanks, Francesco. Maybe last couple in May. Uh, Did you have a question at all? May is our uh, my surgical partner who does all the procedures. Uh, We roll our procedures, structural procedures together. Uh, Francesco, May, uh, do you have a comment or? 
Yeah, good day. Thank you for such a great talk. And it, you know, your in, your insights for the next five years is fantastic. And I really appreciate it from one of the from a surgeon standpoint. Um, I actually wanted to ask, uh, you know, now that we are more aware of the disease and disease prognosis, do you two questions actually? Um, do you see that in your hospital you're performing more tricuspid isolated tricuspid surgery? And the second question is, in your mind, um, what kind of independent developments in the tricuspid physician transcatheter do you think should develop solely for tricuspid? Because now, you know, we've been kind of applying mitral therapies, transcatheter mitral therapies in the tricuspid physician. Um, uh, what kind of things do you think that we should think about when we're developing transcatheter tricuspid therapies? Thank you. So the first, first answer is uh, yes, we see more patients, we see earlier patients. Once you develop a, a, a program, you see patients coming earlier. And so many of these patients are still surgical candidates. And uh, for those patients, it makes sense to make a, make a discussion and, uh, and, and see whether uh, surgery remains a better option. In some occasions, it is the case. Uh, for instance, if you have a patient who may benefit from uh, RF ablation together with the, with, uh, with the tricuspid repair, let me make one example. Uh, in terms of which technology has to uh, develop faster, I think annual plasty, uh, I, I would like to hear from Azim as well. I was very unhappy about uh, uh, millipede being uh, discharged from, uh, from Boston Scientific. I understand because it's a more complicated device, but still, I think annual plasty is an important tool. Uh, and we need to have uh, uh, easier devices than what we have today, uh, less uh, depending on uh, advanced imaging and uh, safer. Uh, once we have that, I think uh, that therapy is going to play a big, very big role, particularly in the, in the early indications. Yeah, I, I agree. I'm, I must admit, I'm disappointed that right now, we don't have an, an, a true direct annuloplasty device for mitral or tricuspid. And I have to tell you, Francesco, when I think back to all the cardio bands we did together and then independently in Zurich and Milano, you know, for mitral, I mean, the results were phenomenal. I mean, we had patients go to, in the right patient, go to zero, you know, MR, residual MR or trace MR, which unfortunately we haven't seen with other direct annuloplasty devices. So, you know, CardioBand really set a very high bar, despite people may talk about complexity of doing percutaneous direct annuloplasty. There's no question about the efficacy in the right patient. And it was a very high bar set by, by CardioBand. And I sincerely hope we see it back again. I'm told we'll see it soon for tricuspid here in the United States uh, with a new generation device. But I also hope we'll see it for mitral in the future. Absolutely. Um, Maybe last question, Augustine. Um, Augustine is our CRF Monty fellow. Um, Augustine, do you have a question? Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Maizano, for this uh, unbelievable talk, as usual. Um, my question is a little bit uh, provocative. Um, given that it is hard to predict the response uh, to uh, uh, repair, and if we extrapolate to the mitral valve, a lot of patients are not suitable for TMVR based on their uh, anatomy. So do you think that in the future, one option will beat the other one, or that we'll have like several devices in our toolbox in order to choose the best therapeutic solution based on, on anatomy considerations? Yeah, you see, uh, transcatheter replacement uh, in the mitral space is much more challenging than tricuspid. Tricuspid, there is no ABOT obstruction, the main issue. And so, and also, uh, I, I don't name the device. I've been uh, implanting a very rudimental device in the tricuspid position, sometimes uh, with, uh, with uh, important uh, PV leaks, then it was okay. So there, it's very forgiving, uh, the tricuspid space for replacement, and it's very effective. So it could be uh, it could become first line option in terms of simplicity and reproducibility and learning curve. The only question remains durability and safety in the long term. Uh, we know, at least in surgical uh, series, that 
the tricuspid position is not as good as the mitral, uh, the, these devices tend to uh, degenerate a bit faster. So I don't know. Uh, I, uh, here there is a personal bias. I'm a repair guy. I'm working on replacement. I accept replacement, but I'm a repair guy. Excellent. Francesco, we kept you much, much longer than expected. Um, I don't know how to thank you. I mean, both from me and Edwin and our whole team here in Monty, everybody who joined. It was really a wonderful lecture, amazing discussion. Thank you for the teaching and your friendship. We'll see you soon. That's similar. Thank you, guys. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Ciao.